Internet. My name is Ayla Teslermabe, and in this lesson, we're going to discuss five things that can make a huge difference in your playing. It can often be what separates a good player from a great player, and these five things can be what adds an undeniable finesse to your playing. A lot of these points actually have more to do with the mindset you're in while you're playing than actual technical tricks you can apply to the instrument. But let's get into it. Number one, vibrato. Let me play two phrases for you, and just think to yourself which one you think sounds better, whatever that means. Or... Vibrato is essentially your fingerprint on the instrument, and can make the most simple of phrases sing with life once vibrato is added. For example, again in case you're still not sure what I mean, here's a phrase without vibrato. And with vibrato, employing vibrato might be more closely associated with electric guitar playing, but it's certainly a technique employed by many great acoustic players too. So essentially vibrato is a technique that all comes from the wrist when done properly. It's just about grabbing the string and moving it down and back to its resting place over and over again to create a modulation and pitch much like what singers do also, you hear great horn players use vibrato. It's just another way to make the guitar sound more expressive. Now, if you haven't explored vibrato yet and you want to, I do have another video where I talk a little bit more about how to actually achieve vibrato. We will link it down below for you if you're interested. Now, where could you use vibrato? It can really be placed anywhere in the phrase. But a good starting point might be at the end, for example. Just add a little finesse to the end of your phrase. It could be placed in the middle of a phrase on a longer held note. These are just some ideas to try out. It's up to you to experiment and find what you connect with. Lastly, I don't think I hear enough people talk about the magic of applying vibrato to a held bent note. For example, to me, this is when the guitar can be at its most expressive and it can be an incredibly useful skill to learn. And speaking of bending, that's actually number two. Let's get into it. I spoke about bending for a brief moment in the last point, but in case it wasn't already clear, learning how to bend well on the guitar, especially on the electric guitar, can be what takes your playing to the next level. So bending is essentially where you take the string and you push it up, or sometimes pull it, but usually bending is in this direction, upwards, uh, and you take the string, push it up, so that you can reach a different pitch. You could bend a half step, up a semitone. You could bend a whole step. You could also bend more than that. So bending in tune and taking the time to build accuracy to constantly hit the right pitch is so essential. For example, let me play a lick with a bend in tune so you can hear what it's supposed to sound like, and then one that's slightly out of tune. And just compare and contrast. So we have. I actually played it three times there because I just wanted to give you a couple more examples of what it can sound like when you're not quite in tune. It's really hard to build the facilities to be able to bend in tune, but it's so worth the time and effort. A way you can do that is by always checking your reference pitch when you are first learning how to bend to build that connection between what you hear in your ears and you know the muscle memory you build on the guitar. So if I know that I'm trying to bend a whole step, I'll actually play note I'm trying to bend to so that I can hear if it's in tune or not. It's not quite right. It's not quite right either. That's better. Now another thing you could consider doing is actually putting a headstock tuner on your guitar so that when you're practicing your bends you'll be able to see in real time whether or not you are bending in tune. So if you're not already convinced of the importance of bending in tune, 
I just want to show you what out of tune bends can turn into if you don't correct this habit. This is something I've run into a lot in, in my teaching. You sometimes hear this kind of bend. Something like that. Where, you know, it sounds a little bit like a mosquito. You might notice that the inconsistency of pitch is a little bit mosquito-like in its quality. And again, I hear this type of bending quite a lot. So if this might apply to you and your play, maybe now's the time to take some time to practice your bending more. That being said, if that's what you want it to sound like, then you do you. But <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. Uh, and again, bending can be a very difficult skill to build. I know it was for me, and it can take a lot of time and effort to become proficient at it. So please be patient with yourself. It's a journey to get there and just have fun with it. Number three, space. This topic is more conceptual than anything else. It's all about learning how to hear music and emotion even in the silence between notes. Or as the great quote goes, music is the space between the notes. The space between notes can sometimes be just as expressive as an actual played note, or it can be exactly what is required to take in the full emotional quality of a note that you play. For example, <laughs> Where can you use space in your playing? You can use space as a dynamic tool to build anticipation the way someone might if they were speaking. And speaking of speaking, a very cool trick one can implement to make their playing more expressive is to try and have your phrases mimic the way you actually speak with words. Hi, I'm Ayla, and this is me mimicking the way that I speak. Kind of. For instance, try holding your breath as you begin a phrase and take a pause as soon as you run out of air, just as you would when speaking with your voice. Here's an example. Something I've noticed in my own playing, especially when I'm here at Guitario and my voice is actually mic'd while I'm playing, is I can actually hear myself breathing in the spaces between my guitar phrases, or sometimes at the beginning of the phrase when I don't start right on the downbeat. One, two, three, four. Something like that. But it's not just about leaving space in your own playing. It's essential to listen to what all of the other musicians around you are doing, whether you're playing with other people or just to a track. You never want to step on anyone else's toes and interfere with any other part of the music. By overplaying and not leaving enough space, you might be interfering with another musician's ability to express themselves properly through the music. So this leaves you with two options. Either lock into another musician and play with the same phrasing and rhythmic intention as them, or play around other elements of the music in the pockets and in the space. Now, speaking of pocket, let's move on to number four, which is pocket, and let's talk more about the rhythmic nature of music. So pocket is an even more conceptual point than space. But I cannot stress enough how profoundly it can impact your skill as a musician. So it's not just about playing at the right tempo. It's about playing in the groove of the music that just makes you want to move and dance and all of that. It's like getting so used to the rhythm and groove that you just play within it confidently. It's about connecting to an underlying groove and rhythm. So one can even be in the pocket when they're playing totally alone. So I'm just going to play along to a track now. I'm going to really, really pay attention to and try to feel what the drummer is doing. I'm going to try my best to play in the pocket. And even if I'm not playing totally with 100% rhythmic precision, though I mean, I'd, I'd hope that I would be, 
the most important thing is that the groove feels good to the listener and makes them want to dance or tap their toes or nod their head along or whatever. So let's go. Pocket is one of those things that you sometimes just need to hear and internalize in order to understand. But it's very interesting to note that a lot of the most in-pocket music wasn't even played to a clip track, or isn't even totally in time. For example, shout out to Rick Beato, who has this fascinating video he did comparing a drum break in Sucker by Nick Jonas to Funky Drummer by James Brown. And don't get me wrong, it was awesome to hear a drum break in a modern pop song, However, there was just something about Funky Drummer that was just undeniably funkier. And Funky Drummer isn't even perfectly in time when you try to line it up to a click track. Well, Sucker by Nick Jonas clearly is, and it's totally in time and it's quantized and it's just like rhythmically perfect. But somehow it doesn't quite possess the same quality that just makes you want to nod your head and tap your foot in the same way. The groove just doesn't quite feel the same. So Pocket requires you to listen to the other musicians around you more than you listen to yourself. Or even if you're just playing on your own, you have to feel the pulse of the groove enough that you can play within its rhythm. So as an assignment, if you haven't already, please listen to Questlove's drumming. And yes, he's a drummer, but guitarists can absolutely internalize his ability to connect with the groove of the music and use it in their own playing. So a great place to start would probably be the record Voodoo by D'Angelo, which Questlove plays on, and it's probably one of the most in-the-pocket pieces of music I've ever heard. And better yet, try playing along. I think the greatest way to start working on your pocket is to play along to players like Questlove, or really anything James Brown ever recorded, and try to listen to the music around you more than you listen to yourself as you're playing. Now number five, think about the emotional intention while you're playing. So our last point might just be the most conceptual of all, and it's about keeping emotional intent at the forefront of your mind so that it drives every musical decision you make, even at a subconscious level. The true purpose of music ultimately might be a subjective thing, but from my own understanding at least, music has the ability to convey feeling and emotion on such a deep level. Pretty much all of my favorite music of all time excels at that in some way, and almost all of the greatest songs of the past, present, and likely future seem to share this quality too. To draw on my own personal experience, way back in the day, a few years ago, when I was 15 years old, I uploaded a cover of Led Zeppelin's Since I've Been Loving You on YouTube. And it wasn't a perfect cover by any means, but a lot of people seemed to connect to just some sort of emotion that I was able to convey through my playing. And it's a blues rock song that's about immense pain that being in love can cause. And though I couldn't relate to that exact subject when I was at that young age, being 15. As I was playing, I was constantly picturing, you know, the most painful experiences I've ever had in my life. And I, of course, won't divulge exactly what I was thinking about here on the internet, but I was focusing on this visualization more than I was actually thinking about what I was playing. Now, had it been a joyful song or any other type of emotion, I would have tried my best to keep that emotional intent at the forefront of my mind while I was playing. If you really do this and meditate on this feeling, you will only be thinking about serving the song. And this makes it easier to push your ego aside and just focus on emotional communication through your playing. So you won't be thinking about how to show off or the little technical details that ultimately you know, don't really serve the piece of music. You'll only be thinking about how to capture the feeling of this piece of music that you're playing. This emotion can come through in your dynamic level, how busy or how much space you leave in your playing, the notes you choose, but in my experience, the most effective way to be able to play music like this is to learn a piece of music so well that in the moment, you don't really have to think about what you're actually playing physically. And it leaves room for you to just focus on the emotional intention of what you're playing. So there we go. There are five things that I think make a huge difference in your playing. Again, I know a lot of this stuff was very conceptual and there wasn't necessarily a huge amount of playing in this lesson, but I hope these things can help Bring something new to your mindset when you're playing. Again, we talked about vibrato. 
spending, space, pockets, intention. Uh, and I would love to know down below in the comments which of those things you think you might be neglecting in your own plan and you maybe want to tackle and work on next. That would be awesome to hear. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a beautiful day and bye.